Hello, my name is uh, Ingo Schranz, and I would like to talk to you about the undergraduate research I've done over the last couple of decades. Not me, but my students specifically, and uh, just some of the highlights. And so I'm an inorganic chemist who's interested in ligand design for the purpose of making an active catalyst. And so I, uh, in graduate school, I worked with these uh, three heterocycles here, cyclodiphosphazanes, cyclodisalazanes, and diazosylophosphatidines. They were uh, ideal because you can easily modify them. Each of these R groups can, can be turned into, into whatever you want it to, other amines or phosphenes, and so you can have really nice uh, uh, ligands from there, and they're cheap too. Phosphanes, amines, and silanes are not, not that expensive. And then <clears throat> Uh, and so my main focus today is going to be on the diazosylophosphatidines and, and how they are uh, easily modified to, and then attached to certain metals. And we'll, we'll see a little bit about that. Well, why do, why do we want to make ligands and transition metal catalysts? Well, catalysis is important for many aspects of making materials or just making drugs and if, if you, here's a little summary of some examples polymerization hydrogenation hydroformylation hydrocylation and each of these you are breaking a carbon carbon bond and you're making a new type of bond a carbonyl or a silane or just uh, you're just uh, forming carbon hydrogen bonds in any case it's a functional group transformation and, and those can be important and we are always looking for for new catalysts that can do different things and that are cheaper and uh, and work better anyway. So so it's an important industry. Uh, of course, catalysis uh, had a major breakthrough. Here's one great example of a wonderful catalyst uh, made by Wilkinson, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973. His uh, uh, tris triphenylphosphine chlororhodium complex here so you, you see these ligands very simple monodentate triphenylphosphine ligands they're somewhat bulky and because rhodium has the preferred uh, square planar geometry uh, uh, these triphenylphosphine ligands are rather bulky right you can imagine that they want to push away from each other to go to a tetrahedral and so that puts some steric strain on that but what really makes this uh, an active catalyst and studies have been done on this is uh, that one of those ligands, because of its bulk and its steric strain, actually comes off to form this T-shaped transition state, and, and that creates that, that catalytic site where, where now your, let's say, your ethylene can come in and attach, and your hydrogen gas can then hydrogenate in a catalytic process. Uh, and, and, and so the goal here is to design a host or a ligand that creates some sort of steric strain, but it's not too bulky, so it can still be attached to a metal, but also leaves an active site open, a site that you can activate, like, like, like here. And so we're looking at sterics and then also electronics, right? So you want to have an electronically unsaturated transition metal environment so that uh, <clears throat> the, the metal will act as a Lewis acid and, and seek out to to act or react with other materials. And, and so this was back in 1967, a very active uh, catalyst. But we've, we've also had metallocene catalysts. And since my focus is uh, uh, polymerization, the rhodium catalyst is more for hydrogenation and, and other simple, I don't want to say simple, but other catalytic processes. So, so these metallocenes uh, actually go back also to Nobel Prize winners back in, in the 50s, Ziegler and Nada, who made these uh, zirconium complexes. And so the, 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 uh, the discovery of ferrocene, which, which is, of course, the iron equivalent here to cyclopentadiene rings sandwiching an iron center, was discovered by accident in 1951. But it was kind of a major discovery because carbon to transition metal bonds were rare at the time. And, and so this allowed for uh, an entire industry to, to just explode. And so these metallocenes here, the one that I have, uh, the uh, circled here, the zirconium, titanium, and hafnium ones, 
they're referred to as the Zeke Donata catalysts, and they help us make plastic. So that was really what was used. And, 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 and so you can now modify and, and increase its activity here, right? So you can imagine zirconium with four groups sort of to attach here as a tetrahedral environment. And, and so if you tether these two cyclopentadiene groups to make a bridged metallocene, or so-called ANSA metallocene, then you're increasing the steric strain. So that's one modification that you can make. You, you, you know, designing this ligand that has a steric strain uh, decreases that angle, which increases reactivity. And then you can take that one step further here with these constrained geometry catalysts. That's what the reference is for here in, in 95 for the constrained geometry catalyst. And you are also modifying the electronics here. So if you, if you want to look at the, uh, the cyclopentadiene and you consider that a five electron donor, then this nitrogen over here is, is a, a, a three electron donor at best. So you're reducing, maybe even you can argue a, a, a one electron donor, <clears throat> but it does have that lone pair and it's very likely that it uh, will donate some electron density in, into a D orbital of, of zirconium there. But anyway, so the modification is an electronic one so you're, you have a, a steric strain as well as a, uh, a, a reduced electronic environment. And, and, and so that leads usually to some catalysis. And then, of course, you have, have to test that for the different processes. All right, so this is just some background. There are uh, the early transition metals. Of course, they're electron, not electron deficient, but they have all the D orbitals you can still fill. And, and so they usually are pretty reactive and good candidates and they're not that expensive but they have been uh, I guess this is already 20 years old as well but Brookhart and Grubbs, Grubbs Catalyst and and um, they've designed some some ligands that host late transition metals or middle of the road like iron here that are catalytically active right and, and so just to highlight these are really really old statistics but but you know it's still a big it's still a big industry here, right? My statement, 70 million metric tons of polyolefins are produced each year. Those are all of those, those polypropylene, polyethylene, your plastic bags, your Tupperware, rub, uh, all those plastic containers. And then there are other uh, uh, plastics that are, of course, used on a daily basis. I look around my room and I can, I can see all kinds of plastic. And, and so it is an important industry and, and they're always looking to improve that and make it more environmentally friendly. And so here, iron and, and nickel catalysts made by Brookhart and, and Grubbs, and th what they have in common all, and so we, we kind of want to model this, this. Again, you have this ligand in, in the back that protects the reactive site here, and then it has an open site for your substrate to come in. You have to activate it, and so that's kind of the goal as well. So work on sterics. And then uh, don't encapsulate your metal completely or it won't have a reactive site left. All right, so, so now I'm going to show you how to make the diazosylophosphatidine uh, uh, starting block. I'm not going to explain all of the uh, steps in, in great detail here, but it's, but it's pretty simple, pretty cheap. Dimethyl dichlorosilane, four equivalents of tibulamine. You just reflux that for four hours and, and you get the disubstituted silane here, the diamino silane. <clears throat> of course, you need an excess of, of tibulamine because you are liberating HCl when you're replacing the silicon chlorine bond and that HCl is going to need the base trap. And so we just add additional tibulamine. So you get, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's what's shown here. You get tibutyl ammonium chloride precipitating out. And, and that's a very clean, high yield reaction. The second step uh, is a little bit trickier, but kind of fun. And uh, uh, that's one of those really good tests for undergraduates to, to learn the technique. And uh, uh, I think most of my students have actually made the, the plumbling here. And uh, so it turns out that if you deprotonate with butyl lithium, uh, you know, a strong base will take those right off. And then in theory, you can you should be able to add PCL3 to that to go straight to this, what I'm going to call SIP, 
starting block because then we're going to use this to modify further. Uh, but it turns out your yields are, uh, are much higher and it's a very clean reaction if you make this plumbling. And, and so you add this at negative 78 degrees, uh, so dry ice temperature and isopropyl alcohol to make this plumbling that has beautiful orange crystals and then you basically, it's almost like a titration, you add PCL3 to that and the color will go from, from orange to clear and that's when you know you're done. But of course, you measure out the quantities and you can have a little bit of excess. And, and, and then you just, uh, most of the time, you just pump that dry and and, uh, and pump off all the volatiles and, and you get your, your building block that way. And so there are several different modifications you can make with this SIP. Well, one of the most frequently uh, things that we've done is put an amine on there. That's a, that's a pretty easy reaction. You just take a lithiated amine. Uh, again, you can control with the R group here. You can control the bulk. We'll look at that in a second. And then you can, you can do a couple things here. One modification is you can oxidize with elemental sulfur. Or azide here, this should be should be N N three R with an azide. You can oxidize phosphorus three to phosphorus five, and then uh, after deprotonation here, I guess I have that on the on the slide. You can have, uh, you know, it's not a great environment here. You you have a lot of open sites, but it it works really well. And then you can still modify the bulk, especially if you're using an azide. But that's on the next slide. Oh, maybe not. Oh, here's just one of the examples of the ligand and how we know that we've had it. And uh, you, you see that we've chosen here a fairly bulky R group, diisopropyl uh, aniline is what we, what we used uh, to, to, replace, to uh, replace the chloro, phosphorus chlor uh, chlorine bond, and then just sulfur. It's an easy, easy reaction. Just add elemental sulfur to your ligand and cook it for a while and it usually just oxidizes you can crystallize it this way uh, what's nice about these ligands is, uh, is the nmr spectra are usually pretty clean uh, we have the teric butyl groups of course and you just uh, you know you just you just watch that shift from as you modify it there are some uh, sometimes drastic shifts of course you can also take phosphorus nmr and carbon this is a proton and so each of the groups here, so we have, we always do this in benzene. So one of these is C6D6. That's also our reference. We don't put uh, TMS in there at 116 ppm. And uh, of course, you've got AB here. You've got, got some of the uh, phenyl protons here. And uh, anyway, you've got a ni nice large singlet here. And then the methyl groups on the silicon, not diastereotopic. They're very clean here. Uh, and then uh, if you zoom in on that, I don't have a zoom, you can actually see that's the methion D here on the isopropyl group. And uh, anyway, you, you, and even the hydrogen shows up. So this is a very clean, there's no impurities in there. And, and then that's your ligand. You just then deprotonate with, with butylithium. Okay. And so all of those steps are, are uh Air sensitive, or there is always a, a problem. You know, if any water gets in, you can cleave cleave this bond, or or so. Uh, or silanes are reactive, and so it means. And, and so what we do is we, we try to keep it away from air, and and, and so this is also new to uh, most of my undergraduate students. They haven't used this equipment, but it's kind of fun to learn these these techniques. Everything has specialized glassware. This is called a high vacuum line or a schlink line. It has uh, two manifolds. It has, you can see here, here's this one here is hooked up to vacuum. And this one is hooked up to, uh, I think it's the other way around. <laughs> this one, one of them is a uh, vacuum is the larger one is the vacuum and, and the smaller one is, is hooked up to an inner gas. And so you see these drying towers here. So I also have my nitrogen or argon tank uh, and I have it go through the copper catalyst to take out oxygen, and then it goes into the uh, molecular cysts to take out any any other potential. And see some dry right here. So you're filtering even your argon just to make sure it uh, 
it is completely dry when it enters your vacuum line and, and then it goes into your vacuum line. And uh, of course you have a high powered uh, vacuum pump hooked up to this. And uh, so here you see the vacuum line and uh, uh, the two way stopcock. This is how you redirect and then uh, you can either uh, evacuate or, or backfill here. Right? You, you can see where we're here, you're making a connection to to the gas and then uh, in this position it's shut off and when you turn it up so this is how you, how you know and then when you turn it up you're going to open the channel to the other to the other valve so you can either evacuate or backfill your your glassware all right so that this is uh, the vacuum line and then you have to have uh, you can't just have a a regular dropping funnel everything has to have a pressure equalizing side arm so that's what this is here, you know, you, and, and, and a way to evacuate. And then you either transfer with cannulas or, or just needle and, and syringes, reflux condensers, as long as you have. And then that has to be hooked up to a bubbler, of course. Always have to have an inlet somewhere so you can, you can evacuate and backfill. And then filtration, you can't just hook up, uh, you know, throw things into a Buchner funnel or do gravity filtration. Because you got to keep it away from air. So again, uh, again, you have this pressure equalizing side arm and a stopcock, so you can control that. And then uh, you know, so you basically you you're filtering uh, from here. This is your reaction, and you put it in your product. It's going to end up in here, and then you hook this up to the vacuum. All right. Uh, your solvents also should be thoroughly dried, and so we have these these solvent stilts. Uh, we we reflux. Uh, our solvents, we have THF, toluene, and hexane. Those are the main solvents. We reflux them over a sodium, and then you use a little benzophenone, and benzophenone, when it's completely dehydrated, it turns into a deep blue ketel, uh, and that's how you know, and then you can collect, right? So you're basically uh, turning on uh, the temperature. Once it's blue, it goes up. You have a condensing part, you, you collect here, you shut this off, and so it, it collects, and then you can, you can either, if you are a frequent researcher, you can do this every morning like we did in graduate school, or, or you can actually transfer your solvent into a Schlink flasks, and that works really, really well, at, and they keep in there for quite a long time, so you basically, you can take a cannula and then transfer them into, into these... Um, Schlink flasks, and so this this Teflon sleeve is actually uh, this Teflon stopcock is actually very good at keeping uh, the moisture out. I I sometimes have this. We have this for six months or so. Once a semester, we we distill our solvents, and you can put some molecular sieves in there as well, right? So then you can just hook this up to the vacuum line, and then backfill and get your solvent out a little bit at a time. Like I said, it works really well. Well, <laughs> I apologize for this cartoon, but I, I, I d didn't get a picture of my transfer cross. And I, you know, and I, when I was in graduate school, we used a transfer cross. And uh, it didn't occur to me that nobody really knows what a transfer cross is. It's just kind of like when you're German and you eat sauerkraut for breakfast with Spiegelei. I mean, you know, that's everybody eats sauerkraut. And then you come to America and it's like, you ask, how was your sauerkraut this morning? And they look at you like you're from planet Z. So this is kind of that same situation. I didn't realize transfer cross is so unusual, right? If you have $50,000, you can have a glove box. But if you don't have $50,000, this transfer cross actually works really well. So what you do is, and just vocabulary, technically what I've shown here and here, these are both adapters, you know, gas inlets, but... But just we, when we say adapter, we usually are talking about the one uh, that has a male-female opening, and that's that's what this is here. You hook this up to the transfer cross, and then you have an inlet uh, here. And so, if you want to transfer some solid, for example, that's air sensitive to your reaction vessel, it can get quite complicated. So you hook this up, right? You get a stopper in here as well. Okay, and you hook it all up, you grease it, and then you can uh, evacuate that. And so you usually what you do is you, you, you weigh this, 
with a separate stopper, right? And I always put like a rubber band around it so I know which stopper that I have used. So we know the mass of this and, and usually we put a stir bar in there too because we're going to do a reaction with this stuff. A lot of times uh, people forget to put a stir bar in there. And then you come in and you hook up and that's a technique. You know, you, you, you evacuate this whole thing. Then you backfill, and then you have to be very fast about about taking the cap off and putting putting the flask on. Uh, but it does actually work, and, and you do learn this uh, very fast, or, or you have no results. Anyway, and then you go in with a long spatula. We've had a custom-made, really, really long metal spatula that you can then bring in here, and you can scoop some out. And dump it in there, scoop some out and dump it in there. Sometimes if crystals get stuck, this is why you have this. You can come in and push it down and then you go and weigh it, right? And so sometimes you sit there putting it on and off and on and off and it can get kind of kind of tedious. But this is a this is a transfer cross and it's actually custom made. And, and when I started uh, at Henderson State University and I wanted to order a transfer cross, Kim Glass said, what's that? And so they actually custom made uh, made me a transfer cross, which is what I used at the University of North Dakota and uh, uh, in graduate school where I got my master's and my PhD. Uh, graduated in 98 with my uh, uh, master's degree. So I've been doing this for almost 25, well, for over 25 years. Started in 95. Anyway, that's just the glassware. And then it doesn't stop there. You also uh, need to be able to take NMRs or can't really do TLC, you're exposing it to air. You, you, you can't really do uh, GCMS, usually decomposes, but you can take uh, NMR. We, we also dry our solvents, right? We, we distill benzene over, over sodium as well. And these are young tubes. I don't actually use them. We, we, we just take a, take a syringe. and uh, No, sorry. We take a needle, hook it up to the vacuum line and blow argon through it. And just, you can see the NMR tube here, just kind of flush out the NMR tube, take a tiny little septa and then, and then uh, uh, seal it with some parafilm. It's usually what we do is, is good enough. And then you can go in uh, and, and uh, in, in your, insert your, your, your sample, your solvent sample, but, and run it right away. Don't, don't have it in there. But I have actually done some reactions. In fact, I'm going to show a reaction with that I did in a young tube a little later on. But this also has a Teflon stopcock and then you can actually hook this up to the vacuum line to evacuate it and then backfill it with ethylene, for example, or, or hydrogen to, to check for, for catalysis. Okay, so this is the glassware. Now let's go look into making one of these ligands. I showed you the one with the diisopropyl aniline, so that, that gave it away. That was the end product. But uh, So we just took aniline and uh, replaced it and sulfur to oxidize it and then you you try to make a nickel complex and what happened unfortunately is we got dye substitution and you don't know this when you take it, the NMR that you have two of those you don't want two of those you want chlorines here right so we got a crystal structure it's like hmm okay you increase, uh, you know, and you mess around with the stoichiometry a little bit. You know, you, you use a huge excess of nickel or, and, and you know, it, it, it doesn't work. And so you just bulk up, right? So then you replace your phenyl group with the tubule group. Still, you get dimerization. And then uh, we actually, instead of sulfur, oxidized with paratoluidine here. So, so that puts a little bit of bulk in. And then so you've got uh, aniline and you've got two phenyl groups here and that still wasn't enough. And uh, of course, I've just described uh, 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 two months worth of research in, in two minutes. Uh, and then finally, finally, beautiful actually, diisopropyl aniline did the trick. This, these isopropyl groups are just uh, bulky enough to produce a, a mono uh, 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 mono substituted nickel complex, right? And so we we uh, uh, so our nickel our nickel wasn't nickel chloride. We did nickel chloride uh, bis uh, tributyl phosphine, and so you, you get you, you get this compound here. And our proof is of course our X-ray crystallography. This is a structure shown here, and so I've, I've, I've arranged the nickel complex according to 
the way the crystal structure is shown. So you can kind of see here the nickel and that's a square planar environment, kind of like the rhodium. Nickel prefers that. However, nickel, if you uh, increase the bulk, it'll go tetrahedral. So it can be, it's a little trickier. It, it won't fall apart. It'll go tetrahedral. And then you can actually tell visually because it's paramagnetic. You can't get a, uh, an NMR of that substance. But you can, uh, you can also tell by color. Usually they're bluish green are the paramagnetic tetrahedral. Four coordinate nickel centers. And then the tetrahedral one, uh, the square planar ones are orange red. So this was deep orange, and, and so we're looking for a steric strain. If you look at the, uh, I've highlighted the uh, the bond angles around nickel. So there's a little bit of a of a strain here. So so this angle here has, let's see, that's the nitrogen sulfur uh, is 81. So you do see it's it's little tighter than normal and. Uh, so I don't recall if we tested this one. I have one that we tested in a bit. Uh, so that's just one step. You've already seen the NMR. And that's how it goes. You know, you make something, you take an NMR, you grow a crystal, and then you go on the testing. Uh, so let me show you. You can modify. You've already seen that you can you can make, make this pretty easily. And you can modify your, your bulky group here. And you can actually uh, modify both of those to make some very interesting uh, ligands, you can also just tether two of these diazosylophosphatidines. All you have to do to make a bisphosphine ligand is you deprotonate and then uh, add a second uh, SIPCL to that, and so you can tether them, and then, uh, that makes some really nice uh, four membered cycles. So then your metal goes here. This also has a very good. Steric strain, you can make some asymmetric ones by, by this is tricky because you have uh, two phosphorus three centers. So trying to only oxidize one of the phosphorus uh, sites is, is, is fairly tricky, but it can be done. And so now you all have five membered rings that are asymmetric. And, and so there's, a, of course, a different way to get there. It's a more controlled way if you oxidize first and then, then you have higher success of only oxidizing one of the phosphorus. So there's a variety of different possibilities here and, and almost endless. And then you can play around with all of the transition metals. And I think you can have a hundred years of research just with the diazosylophosphatidine, but it doesn't stop here, right? So we, we've, we've already looked at this reaction where you can make a bisphosphine uh, that can make a four membered uh, metal cycle and which has going to have some some strain. You can also make uh, use this uh, bis dichloro uh, phenyl phosphine, and just add it to the plumbaline. And I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to use this. I use this idea uh, for for my most recent research project. So so so. To try to remember this reaction here. It's pretty important. So it works. It's got fairly low yields. This is kind of expensive, but it worked. And, and the reason I'm showing it is because it actually made a very good catalyst. And we did, did some testing of that. So we took this, this bisphosphine here. We called it Flossphos because one of the undergraduates, he wanted to go to dental school. And so we called it Flossphos. And so his name is... Uh, uh, Steve Mitstoki, he was the Flossfoss guy, of course, aha, principal author. Anyway, so yeah, we published that. Of, of course, Dr. Stahl should get most of the credit. He was my PI and, and it was his idea. So credit, give credit where credit is due, right? Anyway, I did most of the research and Graham did, did a lot of this as well. And we both helped Steve. It was really his, his project. Anyway, so then we made this bisphosphine here and... Uh, I believe I have a crystal structure. No, I don't. But either way, we actually then took a little bit of that, put it in a bomb calorimeter and some toluene, and then pressurized it with, with po poly po polypropylene. No, sorry, propylene gas. Okay. And and uh, and uh, out came a Tupperware container, as you can see here on the right. But, but so uh, that's actually pretty cool. So you tested your you were we were able to test our 
our potential catalyst and found that, yes, you can actually make a polymer out of that. So it, it is active. And uh, that's the one that got patented by, by Chevron Phillips. And uh, I did get a very nice uh, uh, stipend for one year where I didn't have to teach. And that was excellent. You can make some monodentate ligands. And the reason we did that, uh, my idea was uh, for nickel, because nickel can be square planar and tetrahedral. And so I thought that this would be great. Maybe we would see a square planar complex for the butyl derivative and then a, a tetrahedral complex for the T butyl derivative. Turns out they're both square planar and, and they're really they're really not bulky enough enough to do this. And I, I do believe it's that it's that four-membered ring that really squeezes this together and opens up that side it, to allow um, the geometry to be square planar. But this is actually pretty simple. Uh, all of my students make SIPCL, and, and then sometimes they run out of time. And so I thought this would be a nice little quick project. And it turned out to be great because we, we ended up getting a nice nickel compound and a crystal structure. Uh, OK, so it's really easy. You just take butylithium, and it will instantly go on and replace that chloride group and lithium chloride will precipitate and you can, you can make these two ligands. All right, so here is a NMR, proton NMR of the SIPN bu. I know it looks a little messy. I showed the uh, entire range to show you. Here's your C6D6 benzene. And if you zoom in, you, you see it's actually a lot cleaner than you think. So that's our handle here. This is the this is the the T butyl group that we need to to monitor and make sure that uh, it when it shifts then we know it reacts so it's it's one point one six and then again you see the two methyl groups here over here those are diastereotopic and so that can also be quite helpful and then uh, you know so somewhere in there is the butyl group uh, and no need to go into any detail but what is important is that 1.16 all right so what i did is i had a, i had a gram of rhodium and i made this uh, uh rhodium one ethylene complex and, and wasted probably got a 40 percent yield on that uh, but i really wanted to see if i can't make a rhodium catalyst with my with my phosphine ligand just the n-butyl derivative and and i did and i i did this myself this was a summer project Anyway, so this was done in the young tube, you remember. That was the one you could see. I just put a little bit in. And then, uh, and then the nice thing about that is you can go to the NMR and uh, monitor it every few minutes. So what I did is uh, after just a minute or so, after adding both of those into young tube, I went. And so uh, it looks like a mess, but it really isn't. Okay. You can, as you zoom in, you can now look at 1.634 that's your ligand so that in that pretty much goes away very fast and then you have a new predominant terbutyl group grow in at 1.482 and and so you also have to keep in mind this is just a few minutes so it's it's still reacting and we can also see the the coordinated ethylene now that could be the starting material or both or or your product but they are there and, and that's also important. So after two days, you get a pretty clean spectrum here, right? That ligand peak's completely gone. And all you have is that 1.482. And then those coordinated ethylenes. So I am proposing that this is this particular structure. And then I was hoping that it would crystallize in the young tube. So just chilled it down but it did not work. And so when I checked after uh, seven days, it was completely decomposed, unfortunately. So this is something I would love to pursue. If, if somebody wants to give me $10,000 for rhodium, I will do that. In the meantime, I'm just gonna go back to working with nickel. All right, so then I had two undergrads, Alex Stackhouse and Dylan Hubbard. Alex is in graduate school at LSU. I'm sorry, Dylan. I don't remember. You went to like some sort of PA school or someplace like that. They both graduated from Henderson a couple of years ago. And, and they took both of the N-butyl and the T-butyl phosphines, and they made both the uh, 
nickel compounds with that. Now, the one, the N-butyl one, we got beautiful little red crystals. Now, they were more orange. And the T-butyl one, uh, as I told you, I was hoping I would make a, a tetrahedral one. They were maroon, but still dark, dark maroon. So most likely uh, square planar. We, we, they decomposed on us very quickly and uh, turned turn, uh, pale. And so we did not. We did not get a crystal structure of that. But I sent that to Brooker and Dr. Michael Roof, or Michael Roof, I guess. I don't know. Uh, he did the crystal structure for us for free. Brooker is awesome. I, uh, uh, it was Dan Frankel who came and tried to sell me an X-ray diffractometer. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so we, we sort of loosely kept in touch. But he remembered me, and I was extremely grateful that, that I got, uh, got this crystal structure uh, you, you can see it's square planar and it's trans, of course. It's not it's not uh, cis as, as I thought, which is ridiculous because the two bulky groups are going to go uh, far away from each other. Anyway, so so that's just a little side project, but it's not all that ex exciting. And, and so then they graduated and I got two, two new students, Dawson Cooley and, and Anna-Marie Oversteek. Anna-Marie's a biology major, actually, and... Uh, started working with me as a sophomore, uh, very, very cool, very interested, very hardworking. And Dawson uh, is a chemistry major. He's going to graduate this year. And uh, uh, part of the reason why I am doing this presentation is to, to give Dawson a little bit of an overview uh, of what we did. And, and, uh, and uh, because I, I am no longer at Henderson and and he would like to know a little bit more of the research he did in the background. So here it is. Anyway, uh, so I thought to myself, remember, we took that one, two, bis, uh, diphenyl, phosphine, ethane, and we added it to the plumbaline to make, uh, to make a bisphosphine ligand, and that's the one that made the polypropylene. I thought we could do the same thing with something that's going to produce an asymmetric uh, Ligand. So I, I, I bought some, and this is pretty cheap, uh, uh, two chlorobenzyl chloride, which is this. And I thought that I could, you know, put my SIP. Let me go ahead and show you the end product here, right? So number five, this is what this is. This is my goal here, my, my ligand goal. I wanted to tether two SIP groups under that two benzyl chloride. Okay. So uh, so we did a Grignard, and we think it worked. And I'll show you the evidence for that. Uh, we had some issues with that. So step one is just take uh, an excess of magnesium. Of course, you do this in dry ether. We did it. I think we did it in THF because that's all I have. So yeah, we did this in THF, and and uh, and then just added PCL two. Sorry, PCL3 to it, and, and so of course, of course, we don't have a crystal structure or none of that. So I'll show you the evidence I have uh, that we made that, and then in you want to, and I thought that you could do the same thing. You just uh, react these two together and form the ligand. So we already know how to make the plumbaline. I showed this in an earlier slide, just as a reminder. You make the diaminosilane and deprotonate and add lead chloride, lead 2 chloride at negative 78. You make the, the plumbaline. We, we did buy some dry ice and, and do that last year. No, actually this year, I think, back in the spring. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So they we, we got that far. Uh, and then the goal was if we do get this, uh, get a crystal structure and then try different kinds of metal compounds. So this this is our big, big baby. I was hoping that we could make it. Uh, we didn't, but I do want to talk about the first step here. It's actually pretty interesting, right? So we took, as I said, we took the uh, two chlorobenzyl chloride and over some dry THF, and then we just stirred it and heated it and added the PCL3. And so this is here in benzene. I have the carbon NMR of uh, Number one here, the, the starting material. And the highlights here are, are benzene. So benzene is a, is a triplet of equal height. 
at 128. And so this is how I know, basically, this is what I think uh, we did. It looks really messy. I wasn't very happy, and I, I could show you the, the other region, but where there were missing points, I mean, missing missing carbon peaks. And, and so uh, the stuff clearly wasn't very soluble. But also you have to argue that there are several different, we do know we have something. And it appears to be a single single product. And so obviously I have to acknowledge that that several different possibilities exist when you do this reaction, the two chlorobenzyl chloride. And so all of them would have a con a similar NMR spectrum. It could also be a mixture, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you why I don't think so, all right? So they did this reaction, they, they, and they got a, uh, a bunch of white crystals. And so this is really amazing. In the 25 years that I've done research, I've never seen anything like this. So they, they got, let's just call it product two. And you see this on the left. And so we couldn't, we, we, we couldn't dissolve it. This is all in THF after filtrate, filtering off the magnesium chloride and the excess magnesium shavings. And it wouldn't go back into solution. So I told the guys, just put it in the fridge, we'll deal with it in the morning. Would you believe that we came in the next morning and found these crystals on the right? Of course not. You'd call me a liar, but it's true. We we uh, uh, you know we walked in there, went to the fridge, and so somehow, who knows? I have to ask a physical chemist how the thermodynamics of this would work. And the, but but they must have redissolved, and then you get these beautiful crystals. And I was really hoping to get a crystal structure. But uh, they, they collapse very quickly. Once you take the solvent off, even if you leave some of the THF, it, it, they turn a peg very quickly. And, and, and so the crystal structure collapses. And the other interesting part is that, that they basically they redissolve. They don't redissolve very well. So I'm not sure what's going on. But what I can tell you is that if I take an aliquot out and don't pump it dry and don't go with a deuterated solvent, if I just take this in THF and put it into our Anasazi and uh, I get a very clean for both. Okay, so I just want to show you the starting material and, and the product. And what I've done is I've referenced the, the THF here, right? Because THF as a solvent is present in both the uh, starting material and, and the product, okay? And, and so the part of to point out here is that benzyl CH2 group here. Okay, that's at 42.9. And then if, if you zoom in, oh, never mind. Okay, and then what you see is for, for the product, and, uh, that shifts upfield quite drastically from 42 to 33. So there's definitely, definitely a single product. And then one of these groups shifts drastically. And it's, it's this group that shifts, the one that supposedly has a phosphorus on it, right? So that makes sense. Uh, what about the other group here? Okay. If I zoom in on that phenyl group here for the uh, two benzyl chloride, I can, uh, and you know, I mean, I don't know if it's A, B, C, which is which, but this is definitely the larger ones are going to be, be these carbons here. All right. And the shorter ones are the quaternary carbons, so they're E and F. And if you look at, uh, at E and F, and you go to the product, it is one of them that shifts drastically. Okay? It is, actually, I mislabeled this because it's going to, no, no, I didn't. It's, it's the E that has the phosphorus on it that shifts drastically. All the other peaks here, they don't shift much, right? And so I would actually argue that we modified both of those. We've replaced both of those chlorines with phosphorus. So that's at least my proposal. Unfortunately, uh, I was laid off because they don't have money at Henderson State University for a chemistry program. So they fired every single one of us. And I have been at Henderson for 18 years, promoted twice, and... Uh, so this is the end of the research. But, you know, if you're watching this and, and you're a millionaire, hire me. I would love to do this. Or, or if you are at some college and, and you need a research chemist, I, I would love to continue this project. It's fascinating. And I, 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 I think it works 
and would make a very interesting catalyst. Okay, or ligand. And then, uh, all right. So we actually did try to to then take that since we were convinced we have that. Uh, but those those crystals, as I told you, once you isolate them, they just don't redissolve very well. So we made some plumbaline in 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 situ, and we added it to those crystals in in some THF. And I must tell you, it was interesting because when I take the plumbaline and I add it to the PCL3, that color goes. It it is basically gone. And so when I added the plumbaline to the, uh, the the chlorophosphine number two, I got no color change. I got no precipitate. Nothing happened. I even heated it probably overnight at maybe, uh, I don't remember the temperature. Uh, I was going to say 80, but that would imply that I have toluene in there. And I, I don't honestly remember what, what solvent we used. As I said, I had to kind of like pick up my stuff and go. So I left things in the lab. Uh, and, but anyway, so, so we, we don't know, but, but we've only tried this once. And so there, there are ways that we can probably uh, continue this research somehow. And, and then obviously there's also an alternative way to do this. You could, uh, you could add, make an SIPCL, right? You take the plumbaline, you, you, you add PCL3 to it, you get SIPCL, our building block that we know we can make very clean. We could add that to the grain yard. So that's another possibility. We can do. I think that's actually a fabulous idea. Gosh, I can't believe this has been 47 minutes. That's a 47-minute talk. I'm sure I'm by myself talking to myself at this point. But I just want to summarize some of the people uh, that worked for me, especially the last four. Uh, Anna Marie Oversteek should graduate next year in May with a biology degree. Guarantee you she's going to get into med school. Same with Dawson. Uh, and then Dylan and Alex, who did the mono, dentate ligands. And uh, uh, my very first undergraduate uh, student, Brian Cook, uh, he helped me uh, put everything together. He, he was fabulous. Anyway, lot, lots of good people here. Thank you for your attention. And that was my research.